Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth installment of NYU Reynolds Speaker Series, Social Entrepreneurship in the 21st Century. My name is Sadna Samaranayaka, and I am an alumna of this program. I studied social entrepreneurship and international development at the Gallatin School. And tonight, it is my very special honor to introduce you to an organization that I have had the pleasure of working for for a while, whose extended army of volunteers I have come to regard as a second family in many ways, and to an individual who has been an incredible source of inspiration to me, uh, one who has been a mentor and an advisor and a friend. My own introduction to Dr. George actually began with the Reynolds program. A colleague of mine in this program, knowing my interests, informed me that I needed to take a class that he was registered in. It was called Strategies in Global Poverty Alleviation. It was being taught at the Stern School of Business, which piqued my interest. And it was being taught by a certain Dr. Abraham George. Now, the issue was that I was registered for a mandatory course that I had to take at the same time, a course on how to write a graduate thesis. And this, for me, was a problem. Now, luckily, I am a part of the Reynolds program, where we are taught that problems are not, in fact, problems, but opportunities. And so I took the opportunity to skip my class and <laughs> went and sat in on Dr. George's class and for the first time heard him speak truth to power about the realities and the issues of innovating and being entrepreneurial in service of communities at the base of the pyramid. The practicality of his approach, the complexities and grit of the stories that he told, and my sense that Dr. George was a tried and true realist, but an idealist at the same time, made me want to take an opportunity the following week to skip my class and the week after that, and the week after that, until I had to find an opportune moment to tell my thesis instructor that I was gonna have to figure out a way to write my thesis on my own. Um, luckily, a year later, Dr. George volunteered to be an advisor for my thesis writing process, so it turns out that sometimes skipping class works out quite well. <laughs> Dr. George has led many lives in one lifetime. A military man, a Wall Street professional, an entrepreneur, an author, a philanthropist, originally from India, a chance to travel extensively through service as a captain in the Indian artillery, made him acutely aware of the deeply rooted nature of discrimination inherent in the Indian caste system. After his military service, Dr. George completed an MBA and a PhD right here at the Stern School of Business. He then began a successful career on Wall Street as a managing director for Credit Suisse and its SunGuard's data systems. He founded a company called Multinational Computer Models, which was acquired in the late 90s, at which point Dr. George decided to walk away from Wall Street and invested in his time in creating a foundation so that he could devote his efforts full time to battling the economic and social injustice that to him is poverty. The full scope and breadth of the work of the George Foundation is really quite immense. His projects have included healthcare, farming and livelihood initiatives, many of, many of which you'll get details on today, a successful national campaign in India to remove the lead content from gasoline at the pumps, and an internationally recognized graduate school of journalism. A cornerstone of Dr. George's work is championing children from the most destitute and hopeless conditions imaginable in India. Dr. George has built a school in rural Tamil Nadu that truly lives up to its name for the children of India's so-called untouchable caste. Shanti Bhavan, as it is called, means haven of peace in Hindi, and it is truly that for the children of rag pickers, trash workers, day laborers, sex workers, quarry workers, that without Shanti Bhavan in their lives would have little choice but to fold into these generational professions. Now, when I went to the school last year, I, within minutes of arriving, uh, wandered into the area where the kindergartners and first graders, four and five-year-olds, were playing. And I was immediately accosted with all sorts of questions, auntie, 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 you know, 
What are those sunglasses on your head? What do those do? Did you get here on a plane or a boat? And there was one girl who stepped up to the front and she asked me a question that really sort of blew me away and, and gave me pause. She said, Auntie, Auntie, what kind of work do you do? Not, Auntie, what is your job? Not, Auntie, where do you work? But, Auntie, what kind of work do you do? And then I thought about that for a second, and I realized, I did the math, and I realized that somewhere between eight months to 12 months prior, this child did not speak a word of English, probably had not seen a Western toilet, likely had not seen the inside of a building, likely had not had a clean glass of water. At that point, I realized that there was something incredible going on here. And it was at that moment that volunteering for this organization stopped being a choice for me. Now, not having a background in education or running a school, Dr. George could have chosen a less daunting way to give back, perhaps. He could have elected a learning curve less steep, maybe circumstances less remote, less dire, but not Dr. George. He is motivated by the belief that the most effective and generationally impactful way of uplifting masses out of poverty is to educate poverty's children. And not just to educate them, but to educate them exceptionally well, and to provide them the tools to carry themselves and their communities forward. As you hear about the various projects of the George Foundation, you will see that Dr. George's commitment to poverty alleviation mandates that he do not what is easy or what is doable or what is possible, but what is necessary. His work is targeted at the populations that most need these interventions. The quiet impact that his work has had, that, I've ha that I have had a glimpse of, is really remarkable on so many levels, as is his candor in speaking about his setbacks, extreme challenges, and things that he would have done different. Not content to just do, Dr. George is also an academic. He's an adjunct faculty member here at NYU and publishes widely on issues related to poverty alleviation at the base of the pyramid. His most recent book, India Untouched, The Forgotten Face of Rural Poverty, has gained wide acclaim in India and abroad. He serves on the boards of the International Center of Journalists and is a member of the New York and South Asia Committees of Human Rights Watch. He is a recipient of the Stuart Sater Award for Social Entrepreneurship. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and privilege to introduce to you today a living hero of mine, Dr. Abraham George. Thank you, Sadna, for the kind remarks. Um, she gives me a hard time most of the time, but today she's very nice to me. <laughs> uh, it's so wonderful to see a large gathering uh, to listen to my story, my story of the last 15 years in India. Um, the fact that you are here tells me that either you are involved in some social cause or you are planning to be in a social cause and make your contribution. There is no better institution than the NYU um, institutions um, that, uh, that can prepare you for that uh, endeavor because you know, poverty is such a major problem. We have almost 4 million people who live below $2 a day, and we need people like you who will get involved in the cause and make a real difference in the years to come. So I'll tell you my story. Before that, I want to tack, thank the Reynolds program, Gabrielle, and everyone else and uh, in, associated with this program for giving me the opportunity. And I want to thank you for coming and listening to me. Um, I believe I have 15 minutes to talk, and after that, you know, we'll have a question and answer session. Oh, by the way, those are my children. Uh, <laughs> uh, would anyone say they are children of untouchables? This is so ridiculous to call them untouchables. And, it, you know, people like you and me would get so infuriated, you know, being labeled something like this for 2,000 years. Uh, it's not one or two years. 2,000 years, the untouchability in India has prevailed. And the question is, 
how do you break that uh, age old tradition? Here is a picture of a small family from which we take our children. Uh, this is um, the house uh, belonging to this man. And he has a young wife and three kids. And uh, this, would be, um, this would be the kid that um, we would probably be looking for, um, the child that we want to make an impact. Uh, is someone who is in the age of three and a half to four years of age. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, one in nine people in the world live in an Indian village. Um, you know, almost uh, two thirds of the world is in villages. And uh, in India alone, there are 750 million people 750 million people living in the villages. Uh, so you can imagine the magnitude of uh, you know, the problem that we, we are facing. Well, here's a beautiful young uh, woman uh, who is an untouchable, by the way. Her entire position is in our two arms. A child, and probably her husband has left her by now. Uh, because most of these uh, women, um, they get married by the age of 14 or 15. They probably would have two or three kids by the time they're 17 or 18. And by then, the man moves on to another woman. And she's left alone to look after the kids. That is how um, rural life is like. They, I have not I have found in my experience living there now 15 years, I spent six months in India and six months in the United States. I've been in the United States for 40 years. I'm an American citizen of Indian origin, but I chose to live in India for six months every year for, you know, and now I have a fairly good idea what village life is like, which I did not have. And I find that most women have, are living with, um, a second or a third man, and in many cases, they don't have any men at all, or they just come and go. And uh, this woman happens to be one whose husband left her. And I think she's you know, someone who is you know, attractive enough for any man. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, here she is. She's got a hen, I believe, uh, with her. <laughs> Now, these people whom we are talking about are very poor. You know, when we think about poverty, uh, we, uh, we often think about, you know, do they have enough food to eat? Do they have a place to stay? Do they have health care? They're all true. But what is their income like? Well, we know from World Bank statistics that 75% of the world is below $2 a day. This shouldn't surprise anybody. 75% of the world is below $2 a day. In India, no, 50% of the world is below $2 a day. 75% of India is below $2 a day. And you are talking about village is in India where almost 750 million people live and I would think more than 80% of the people live below $2 a day. And yet you hear the stories of how India is wonderful, you know, growing so rapidly, the technological boom that is taking place in India, the outsourcing and the billionaires in India, you know, all the wonderful things about India, which is true. There's a lot of wealth being created. But how many people are the beneficiaries? All that we hear is about their story, the story of barely 10 to 20% of the population out of 1.2 billion people. So 20% is still 250 million people, almost the population of the United States. Sure, they are doing well. But what happened to the, all the others? They are 
people like the woman you saw, and they don't have any money to spend other than just to survive. And they live in a place like this. This is not an unusual house. This is the entrance to the house. That's all she has, this, cha this family has. Um, and so we are talking about those lives. Here is the statistics. In India, 7% of the population is about $12 a day. Well, it could be hundreds of dollars a day for barely 100,000 people you know, uh, who own big companies, outsourcing companies, and so on. But 7% is almost like 84 million people, right? 1.2 billion people. 84 million people are about $12 a day. So it's a large enough number. And if you open up in Bangalore or Mumbai, you know, one of those fancy stores, you will have a lot of people coming in, a lot of people coming in constantly. The shop is going to be filled. Bombay store in Bangalore, you can be absolutely sure. It's always packed. You go to Toyota car dealer or a Honda car dealer, somebody is always there to buy the car. That population is there. And when you look at that population and companies make money, they say India is prospering. It's a great, great story. And it is a great story because hardly 20 years ago, it wasn't happening. Nobody could buy a car. So you have some 100 million people able to buy all the luxuries of today, just like you and I in America. Then there is another set of people, almost 18, 20% of the population, that is 250 million people, or 200 plus million people. That's a lot of people, right? 200 million is a lot of people who are below between $2 and $12. They can buy maybe a radio, a television, um, or a small refrigerator after saving a lot of money. They can have a few things, so-called discretionary you know, spending they can have. And they are a huge market for American or Western or any company that opens in India. So between those two, almost 25% of India's population out of 1.2 billion people is a huge market for any company that wants to start business in India. And it's a good place to make your money. It's a good place to invest. And it, that is increasing. Every year, India's population is increasing by 18 million people, 18 million people. So some of the people, most of the people will fall here in this gap. But some of them might move up to that top of the pyramid. So that portion of the pyramid, which is available to you to market to, you know, it's a very, very profitable part of the, the business community. Now, I want to talk about only this block. I want to talk about only those who are earning below $2 a day. In fact, most of these people who are earning below $2 a day, a great majority of them, I'm sorry, by God, uh, Um, a great majority of them, the family income probably is $2 a day. A family, an Indian family in a village has got five people or six people in a family. You know, maybe a, a mother, maybe a man with her, and at least three children or four, five. So there are four to six members in a family. And all of them combined, probably earn two or three or four dollars. So in a, in a sense, the average income for the whole family is 50 cents a day. And they're just trying to survive. So my question to you is, what does two dollars a day buy for you? Well, if everyone in the family was earning two dollars a day, including the small kids, maybe they can do a little better. But that's not the case. And I want to only talk about this bottom of the pyramid, 
This is the bottom that I really talk about as the poor. You know, you can define away poverty differently and say that two to twelve dollars is also about bottom of the pyramid. Well, that's somebody's choice, but I don't like to do that. I really want to talk about only those who are below two dollars a day. Now, why did I get involved after being in America and had the opportunity of doing, you know, going to Stern, studying, starting my own business, working for Credit Suisse and whatever? What motivated me? Well, this is where my journey began. Uh, when I was 18, I was an army officer. Uh, I was sent up to the Himalayas where the Chinese crossed over when it invaded India in the 1960s. I'm an ancient guy. Um, <laughs> and here I am. Uh, um, and uh, <laughs> I, um, I, I was, for a year, I was actually living at 14,000 feet above sea level in the, on you know, the, the valley through which the Chinese uh, invaded India. Um, but that's not what I wanted to tell you. Uh, where my motivation began was when I was um, doing, uh, uh, when I was in service, I had to go through many villages, uh, the tribal places, and so on. And I realized the lives of people in those places. I saw the misery of their lives. I saw firsthand how these people were living. Uh, I was not keenly aware of the caste system yet, because I was born and brought up uh, in a city, in a middle class family. So I didn't have the, you know, any interaction with uh, anyone from lower caste. I heard about it, but not much of you know, awareness. You know where I learned about the caste system? In America. I came to America and I saw on television about India's caste system. That's how I learned about it. And I started reading about it. But I never learned about it in India. And uh, it suddenly offended me to think that all these people, you know, 200 million people, now almost 250 or 300 million people, so-called Dalits or untouchables, they cannot live in the village in the same place where the upper caste live. They have to live in a section of the village where the wind doesn't blow towards the upper caste. The, they have to position their colony in a, every village in a place where the wind normally northeast, I mean south, south, southeast, wind doesn't come towards the uh, uh, upper caste. They cannot go to the same temple to worship. Not even the gods want to see them. They cannot take water from the same well when the upper caste is taken. The indignity of their lives really offended me after living in America and realizing what we try, we take it for granted, what our lives are here. And you know, we have our own problems, but we are trying to correct it. And here, for 2,000 years, we, have, we are having this. And there's no sign of anything changing. You have these villages the way it is. Sure, prosperity is coming to few people in the cities. But these, li these people, their lives are no different. And it offended me. And I said to myself, why is that? After 2,000 years and after the last 20 years of uh, economic prosperity, why is that this is not breaking up? And, it, and I began to ask the questions. And so what really motivated me was two things, social justice and economic equity. The gap between the rich and the poor, I wasn't really impressed by all the wealth that is being created, you know, all the, the outsourcing and everything else, you know, after living in uh, and working in Wall Street and so on, it wasn't one of those great, exciting things to watch. It's nice to see that India is doing well, but it wasn't, it wasn't something that I thought was a great miracle. After all, you know, in India, and Indians get offended when I say this, India started outsourcing and technology breakthrough with year 2000, removing the, the zero, the bug, you know. Indians were asked, and thousands and thousands of Indians were asked to remove the bug, uh, the, 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 yeah. And, 
And I, I, I wrote in my book, I said, well, after all, Indians invented the zero. <laughs> now they have to remove it. So uh, it was exciting. And they made money, and they did a good job. And then suddenly, the outsourcing began uh, in a bigger way. And sure, the country has made tremendous progress. Now a lot of research is being done. Microsoft, in a place like Bangalore, where I spend a lot of time, every American company is there. Every German company is there. Everyone has got his office there. It's exciting to see. Uh, but I wasn't really impressed with any of that. And what motivated me was how do we bring about social justice and economic justice? So here, 25 years later, I returned to India. In those 25 years, I never returned to India. I was busy making money in America. Not a bad thing, no? <laughs> I was preoccupied with making money because I felt that without money, I'll be nobody there. Without money, I cannot do anything I want to do. I really wanted to make a difference to the social injustice and economic justice, injustice. And I, I was thinking through, how do I bring about that change? What is my model? Why is that after all these years of poverty models and everything else and World Bank and everybody else, why is that nothing is happening to these Dalits? There is something wrong in the way it is being approached. And I wanted to see whether, as a business student of NYU Stern, do I have a different model? Can I think out of the box? And that's what motivated me to come. And 25 years later, I decided to go to Shanti Bhavan, I mean, go to India and start Shanti Bhavan School. Sadhana said, Haven of Peace. Well, it's a nice name in India. Shanti is peace and Bhavan is heaven. So I coined that word and you know, it's sort of striking. Um, these are my kids and I'm talking to them. Um, so um, I will say a few things about Shanti Bhavan in a minute. Um, Shanti Bhavan is a school um, conceived from a different way of looking at the problem. It is one thing, you know, you put in a certain amount of money and you can embark on a literacy program and thousands of kids can be put through school and they become literate. Noble thing, you know, the World Bank and uh, other organizations are counting how many people have become literate. Now they say 60% of the villagers in India, village children are literate. Everybody is happy. It used to be 30, now it is 60. But what do, they, what do they do? They can read a signpost and add one plus one, and they are literate, according to the statistician. In fact, I found out that the government officials, the statistician, comes to a village a house, hut, and knocks at the door and asks, have you been to school? Yeah, yeah, I've been to school. Which school? That school over there. He's so excited to say I went to school. But he can't even write one word. And he's counted as illiterate. This is how the numbers add up. Are they fit for today's uh, employment? Are they capable of uh, earning something beyond you know, the menial labor type of income? And so the question is, what kind of model do you really want? Do you really want to have uh, poverty models or education models that would just make a lot of people literate? Which is not a bad idea, primary schooling and middle school and so on. They're all valuable. You know, it's good to send them. But is there a different place for poverty model you know, beyond that? Unfortunately, today, all the poverty models that exist today, they don't talk about quality. They talk about quantity. Lately, there has been some literature. You see criticism of government schools and so on. Government is the custodian of the poor. Government runs education program. Government runs healthcare program. And they are of substandard quality. It is the numbers that count for the government. And if you want funding, you have to 
create numbers. For $10,000, you've got to educate 20,000 people for a year. Then you get your funding. For poor people, there is one standard. For rich people, there is another standard. Rich people send their kids to the best schools. Poor people send them to government schools, and they become literate. That's a model that we have today. And I felt that if we are going to break the cycle of disadvantage, social and economic disadvantage, you have to do something different. And I also thought through, in my own mind, I decided that preaching to people not to discriminate each other is not going to do anything. The landlords and these upper castes are going to behave the same way. The only time they will change their behavior is when the poor, the untouchables, gain good employment. They build a nice home. They are professionals. Then the whole thing changes. In fact, I found out that when an untouchable woman has two cows, her status goes up in the village. She's got two cows now. She never had a cow. So economics is the way. At least as a businessman, that is the way I understood that there is no use talking to people. Otherwise, we will all be going to the church and preaching, and everybody comes out of the church and do all the right things. It hasn't happened. There will be no injustice in this world if that was possible. So my thought was, how do I empower these people, especially the poor? And I could think of one way through education. And the way, place to put it, that investment is on children. Because grown-ups, it's very difficult to change. Once they pass 18, 20, 25, and so on, I can try my level best to educate them. I don't think I can. I can teach them a few skills. They may be able to you know, fix a mech, you know, car par, you know, repair or something. I can teach them, and they'll have a job. But I can't change them. They are not going to be tomorrow's lawyers or architects or you know, professors or uh, engineers or whatever. They are not going to be. I cannot change the others. So it's like Germany and East and West Germany. West Germany gave it up. West Germany gave it up on the East Germans. So OK, put them on social programs. Give them handouts. OK, same thing is true. So I realized that the investment has to be on the children. And if I can create an institution, Shanti Bhavan, that would take a few children and give them the best care and the best education, and they become leaders of tomorrow, they will carry with them hundreds of others, their own families and elsewhere. They will make their own contribution. And if I had 100 Shanti Bhavans, that's what I wanted to do in the beginning. I was so naive that I thought that I could create 100 Shanti Bhavans. And I'm still struggling to run one. OK? And uh, so, uh, but there are hun hundreds of Indians, Ind people of Indian origin, who can run hundreds of Shanti Bhavans. There is no shortage of people with immense wealth of Indian origin. They can start it. They can break the cycle of, uh, you know, of social discrimination. 2,000 years of uh, caste system can be broken within less than 50 years if we had many Shanti Bhavans where the children of Shanti Bhavans will become leaders of tomorrow. They will carry others. That was my original mission. But then I also realized that most people will be going to government schools you know, the government schools are miserable. Infrastructure is breaking down, roof is leaking, you know, teachers don't turn up, you know, absolute toilets are not working. Girls come to the school until 10.30. By the time they need to go to the toilet, they can't. There is no door to the toilet, nothing, so they run home, and there is no studies after that. For five uh, primary school grades, there are hardly two teachers, or 2.2 .2 teachers. That's what I found out in all the schools. So how do you run a school? And imagine, think of yourself, if you are sick, can you study? No. If you've got a chronic ailment, can you study? No. If you're coughing all the time, can you study? No. If your stomach is empty in the morning, you haven't had your breakfast, can you study? No. It's not school attendance. World Bank statistics will tell you school attendance has gone up. Significantly, wonderful. They turned up in school. 
Is that what you want? Or you want outcome? And so you got all these problems are interrelated. Healthcare is in, uh, very important. Income, ability to have breakfast, you know, uh, all these things are related to education. It's not like if one thing is, you know, discrete. So you've got to tackle all these problems together. And area public schools, I decided that, well, we need to worry about that. Uh, now, before I get there, Sadhana tells me I missed some slides here. This is what was created. Uh, Shanti Bhavan looks like this. Uh, cottages where various grades live. And this was a place which I discovered uh, when I first arrived after 25 years um, when I came to India. I said to, uh, I came to Bangalore City, which is the Silicon Valley of India, and I said to uh, Ed, my driver, a taxi I took, I said, listen, take me out of the city. Take me to a village. Take me to a poor village. I want to see what India looks like. Take me somewhere. He said, no problem. He started driving in one direction, and I ended up, within 35 minutes, I ended up in a village. And it looked so different. It has nothing to do with Bangalore City. It is totally different. And within another half an hour, I was deep in rural India. And he stopped by a lake, and he said, this is a place that I come from. It's very, very poor. Very, very poor. There is female infanticide. Most of the people are without food to eat. Healthcare is terrible. Schools don't run. And there is a piece of land on the other side of the lake. If you want to buy, you can buy. So I said, OK, looks very good, looks pretty. I rolled up my trousers, took off my shoes, and went through the lake. The lake wasn't very deep. There was no road. I ended up on the hill. And he said, be very careful. It's full of snakes here and scorpions. <laughs> oh, my god. And so I climbed on top of, <laughs> I climbed on top of a rock and looked around. It was so beautiful, beautiful place. I was watching for the snakes, too. But uh, and that same day, he took me to a Gouda. Gouda is a landlord. And I negotiated with him. He was talking Canada, and I was talking English. And this guy was translating for me. I don't know what he was translating, but I finally negotiated a price. I think he made a big killing out of me. Uh, if I had known the language, I could have done a better job negotiating the price. But anyway, I bought the 30 acres of land from him. Same day. And it was a barren hill. Still, you know, you can see the far distance. There is nothing there. Um, eucalyptus trees, scorpions and snakes. Uh, and the scorpions and snakes, and that's about it. And today it looks absolutely gorgeous. OK, that, by the way, is India. Uh, <laughs> OK. Um, these are cottages that you see, cottages where each grade stays, you know, like that. Um, and we have volunteers from all over the world. We had NYU volunteers. We had Spain, British, Canadian, <coughs> 15 volunteers at a time. They, they stay there. They, they do such wonderful work. They are part of the family. And a number of them are here today. Um, it's become a big family. Shandibhavan now belongs to the people who are looking after the school. I might have started it, but it's not anymore my, you know, you don't live forever. It's your, it's everybody's place. Uh, so that's where it is. Um, and this is the principal who was with me um, from the beginning, Lalita. And this is like a classroom. Um, and the goal is to make leaders of the society. It's a very ambitious goal. You take an untouchable, so-called untouchable child, put through a boarding school type of education, send them to college. Now I have, you know, we have to take care of their college studies. Until they are employed, we have to look after them. Their parents have no knowledge of any subject or anything. They, they are illiterate people. They are not capable of making any decisions. They can't even write an application or you know, anything like that. We have to do everything. And, uh, but you can see. It's no different from an American good school. Here are my three girls here. Uh, how uh, lovely they are, and 
uh, you can see the excitement in there. Uh, This is one model, Shanti Bhavan, you know, where you are trying to have a big impact on few children. But there is another model for the rest of the children, and that is improving government schools. This school is supported by us. It's run by the government, but we train uh, teachers to supplement that school. We fix the toilets. We fix the roof. We make sure water is there. We make sure there is library books are there. And we hold the teachers accountable. And we give them an incentive. If the children meet our standards, we test them separately. We test them. Uh, we tell them what the test will look like. At the end of six months, we test them. And if the children do well, we pay the government teachers a stipend. So we are trying to innovate ways of improving the quality of the education. And this costs much less, but outcome you know, is better than what it used to be. That's all I can claim. It's not going to make you know, dramatic impact, but certainly an improvement. So these are some of the things that we do for government schools. Now, as I started doing work with Shandiba and I realized that uh, uh, the poverty problem is very complicated. Uh, education was one thing that I thought I would do, but then um, that's not enough. Education is going to have an impact, say, 15 years from today. So what happens in the meantime? If people are poor, they're not going to send their children to school. They want them to work in the, in the farm. Uh, if children are poor, they're not you know, going to um, uh, have food and they'll be sick. So we have to worry about the short term. And so the approach for short term um, has to be very, very distinct. And it has to be for adults mainly, so that they can create income, look after their families, so that I can do my long term. Without taking care of short term, there is no long term. Then I began to think through the poverty model from three different dimensions. First is basic services, second is income generation, and third is community development. Just my way of looking at it. There are different ways of looking at it. Um, this is not the only way. This is not any established way of looking at it. Uh, and in basic services, you have to provide quality education, or good education, or better education, both a school like Shanti Bhavan or public area school, area public schools, and you've got to provide health care. Unless people are healthy, they are not going to be able to be productive and go to school and so on. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And housing. Unless their houses are comfortable to live in, it's very, very difficult to, uh, you know, for them to, to uh, survive. Um, so I look at basic services in that way. Now, I talked about education so far. I just quickly go through the Balde Medical. We, so we decided to open a clinic, a 10-bed hospital type of thing, uh, where people could come for medical care. And you can see uh, the people gathering for uh, a camp. A, a camp, uh, you know, a camp is, medical camp is like a one month you might have for two days. Uh, something to do with, um, you know, uh, um, uh, say, a skin disorder or pulmonary problem or gynecology. Or well, it could be any number of things, and people all come that day for that particular thing, and we take care of those needs, in addition to normal visits by people. The nature of the poor people is that they don't come to a clinic or a hospital for preventive care. They only come when their condition is pretty bad. So you have to reach out to them. Uh, uh, Cross-subsidy, we take money out of the journalism school profits. We put it into other projects. We take money out of, uh, of the farm you know, profit. 
if there is profit, and it's sometimes you don't make any, you know, depends on the rain and many other factors, uh, disease and, you know, farming is a very, very iffy business. Um, and hopefully in the long run, we create endowment and sustain it. It's a tough battle. You have to, you have to fight every day to make it happen. Uh, the lessons learned, everybody wants to know. First is think big, act small. Well, you know, I had this great idea of 100 schools. I started with one. I realized that <laughs> one is hard to do. But you've got to think big. Uh, second, don't be afraid to try new ideas. Don't, be, don't, follow, don't have the herd mentality. Just because everybody is doing a certain way, you read articles to do it in a certain way, don't follow. I, I, I never followed any of these things. I read about it. I had a good idea. I did it my way. Uh, and we make mistakes, and you fix the mistakes and go forward. Believe me, you guys have the, the training and the background to innovate, and do innovate and fix the problem. Um, yeah, that's what it is. Um, next one, tell your story well. Um, I thought that if I do my work well the first 10 years, others will see that something good is happening. No, it doesn't work like that. You got to go and tell your story, like I am doing today. You got to tell people what you have done and why they should partner with you, why they should help you, why should they be part of the, the a good idea. And that's the only way you're going to get support. Don't wait for them discovering you. Nobody's going to discover you. My hard lessons. Um, I'll, I'll end with, my, with a story of, uh, I had many stories I wanted to tell, my time has run out, with the story of uh, ethical issues. You know, I came from America to India thinking that with a clean broom I could wipe away thousands of years of all the evil in India, you know, corruption, everything. I realized that my broom wasn't big enough. So, but anyway, uh, this guy like getting frustrated. I sent a container, 40 foot container of wheat to India 10 years ago. And when it arrived at the customs, uh, the customs officials said they want a bribe. And they called me up in New York. I was in New York. I said, no, no bribes. This is for poor people. He said, we are also poor. OK. <laughs> so then I said, OK. Then he said, oh, they have to do a lab test. And they said, it contains alcohol. My old wheat, 40-foot container, contains alcohol. I tried to explain to this guy that wheat ferments, and it creates a little alcohol. It is no harm, nothing doing. Unless I bribe, they won't. So I finally said, burn the whole container. And I burned the container. It took me one week to get permission to burn it. But today, if you ask me, will I do that again? No. I deprived hundreds and hundreds of people, you know, the Indian bread for a whole year on one principle. Did I change that guy's behavior? No. He's not going to change just because I burned it. No tears, uh, you know. So if you want to bring about change, that I can give you hundreds of stories. The, the truth is that if you want to bring about change on these kind of things, it has to be a top down, you know, like journalism school, where you write about these corrupt fellows. You have to fix a judiciary. You have to elect good politicians. Going and fighting with a low level clerk and telling him you won't give the, uh, the bribe, it doesn't work. He, he will put your uh, application in the waste, waste can. You want electricity? Well, you say, yeah, it's coming, but nothing will come. I can give you a story of how do you connect electricity in India, you know? Uh, you had to buy the pole, you had to buy the transformer, you had to bring the guy, and you had to bribe him, and then you get your electric connection after six months. So, uh, so you have to make those ethical choices, and whether you are going to uh, fight every guy, you have to select your battles. That's that's the lesson I learned here. Um, significant impact doesn't mean significant cost. A perfect example is the lead poisoning. I spend money in bringing equipment and doing everything, but the impact is national. Shanti Bhavan is a long term, but the impact could be very big, but the money spent is also a very large. But remember one thing, that long term sustainable change cannot be brought about by mediocrity. Only excellence will bring you that. It's true of business, true of this too. 
If you want to bring about change, that will remain. You have to change the whole system. You have to bring about excellence. And that's what some of these projects are trying to do. There is no sh shortcuts. People look for magic you know, solution, you know, give a few dollars and people become entrepreneurs. You know, it doesn't happen very often. You have to think through very carefully what will bring about sustainable change. And last point, I believe market-based solutions, well, they, they affect, you know, it'll trickle down, but the $2 and below, they don't have the ability to buy things. They don't have the knowledge base to do things. So if you want to bring about change there, you have to have direct intervention. It doesn't mean that market-based solutions aren't effective. Maybe you need to, to find a way that companies will open their factories very close to villages. Maybe you need to find a way where you can train people to be employed in those factories. You've got to find fiscal and monetary policies that will make it possible you know, through direct interventions. Don't wait for trickle down to come because every year 18 million people are added to this pile. And there is no way trickle down is going to get there. Sure, you're going to read in the New York Times and elsewhere that India is prospering. But re remember that prosperity is confined to 250 million people. It's exciting for businesses, but lives are not changed. You want to bring about change, there is no shortcut. Thank you very much. So at this point, we'll open up the floor to questions. There are two mics at the front of the room. Hi, my name is Karen Raz, and I'm a Reynolds Fellow from the law school. Is this on? OK. Um, my question for you is, how do you get kids to stay in school? Um, what have you found? works, what have you found does not work? Is my question an ignorant one? <laughs> In the school, you're talking about the, yes. the school, what does work and does not work? Mm -hmm. um, what works is um, commitment, dedication, caring, you know, and, uh, and be there all the time, you know, leadership, like any other organization. Most problems are management problems. Uh, your teachers will be lazy if you don't you know, <laughs> monitor and hold people accountable. So most problems are management problems. If you have a good management, most things work. I, I hate to sound like a businessman uh, in a poverty issue, but it is true. Uh, you run a good organization, well-managed, it'll work. What doesn't work um, is um, you, um, you know, you leave it to, uh, at least for me, that's the way I, you know, I leave it to local empowerment and all those things are great words to use, but without accountability, it doesn't work. You know, people get mad at me if I say something like this, you know, empowerment is only up to a point, you know. Uh, you need to bring, motivate people and so on, but if you leave it to the local management, it'll be all corruption and they'll take your money and you will see nothing on the ground. Um, there are many things that don't work, but you know, good management is what works. Um, hi, my name is Lauren Servan. I'm a 2008 Reynolds Fellow. And uh, my question is, so there must be a large disconnect between the students and their families back in the village. I was wondering if you, how do they relate to each other if you have seen them do that? And then, um, I, I have a second question, sorry. And um, once they graduate, uh, do they go back and try to create change in their own communities? Okay, this is a very valid question. Uh, but remember that unlike, uh, unlike uh, some indigenous people living in some remote mountainous area, uh, these are not indigenous people. They are they just next door is a landlord who's got a nice TV and this person is living in a hut right next door and you know, starving, okay? So uh, just be sure that what we are talking about. What, if you ask any of these children, what do they want? They want, they'll tell you, if you ask them, those who have been there, well, 
First thing is I want to make a lot of money. Then I want to build a nice house for my mom. Then I want to have a car. And maybe I can have a helicopter. <laughs> this, this is what the children want. They want to change their lives. We cannot leave, leave the burden of India's culture, preserving India's culture or rural, all this stuff to the poor while the rich send their children to Stern. Poor should be able to go anywhere they want. Now, what do they do with their money? As I said, that is for them to choose. If they want to help a child in Africa, that's where they should help. If they want to help somebody in their village, they make their choices. We are nobody to tell them. What we owe them is opportunity, nothing more. Opportunity, give them the opportunity to succeed and be honest about it and leave it to them. Bring them up with values, the value of giving, the value of caring, the value of being sensitive. Those things, if we do well, they will be fine. You know, we worry about leadership qualities and interpersonal communication and all that. All that are important, but there are humane qualities that we want these children to have. And you can list them, generosity, kindness, sensitivity, all these are important things. The idea of giving back, the idea of helping another person, caring. Can, how do you bring about all these things? If you do all, if you can Im impact them in some way with these humane values, by examples, not by telling them stories, by real example, then you will find that they will do the right thing, whatever is good for them. You don't tell them they have to do these things. You don't tell them they have to serve their community. You don't tell them that they have to fit in with their culture of untouchable. They don't want to be untouchables. It's not a burden we want to leave for them. Uh, hi, my name is Seal Sun Lim. I'm a fellow, a Reynolds fellow at the Gallatin School of Individualized Studies. So. Um, before I ask my question, I have to say that I don't know very much about the social and political structure right, in India, but doing community development work in the U.S., um, I think that you know, for those of us who do, it's very obvious that um, there are historic and political and structural reasons for social and, and economic inequity, right? So um, the folks that I work with feel like you know, at the same time that we're building schools, educating, empowering young people in low-income communities of color, we have to do other things to address those structural problems, Correct. right? So campaigns, lobbying, whatever it is. Correct. I'm wondering um, how the, your foundation sees the structural problems in India and then what you're doing to address them. Okay, uh, very good question. Uh, very difficult to answer this also because uh, what America faces uh, you know, in all these issues is uh, uh, problems associated with wealth. In India, it's problems associated with lack of wealth. Okay, uh, here we have, you know, we can spend trillions of dollars on hedge funds or bailing out banks and trillions of dollars. Here, there, there you can't even spend four dollars on a kid going to Shandibon. Okay, so the problems are very different. Now, the structural problems, the, you know, the couple of things. Uh, bad governance is the reason for poverty. You, can, you cannot change the society very easily if the, the system is poor. There is no justice. You cannot go to a court and get justice. If the, the whole place is corrupt, okay, and you discriminate people. If you have all these things, it's very difficult to fix the problem. Now, how do you bring about the change? You know, maybe through journalism, maybe through the media, maybe through the election process, maybe through activists. You know, so these are structural problems that will take many, many years to overcome. But the best hope we have is that we work with few people, well-meaning people, both adults, and bring up children, like Chandiburan children, who will change the world. That's our hope. I don't know how we can bring about change. People just, if I talk to any Indian, you know, how do you change corruption? They said, it's not possible. Imagine, you know, a father coming to the dining table at dinner time, a well, you know, well-educated, making good money, 
uh, who talks about all the bad things about corruption. But then in the lunch or dinner, he's talking how he bribed somebody to get electricity or something connected for his house. And everybody laughs. It's OK for him, but it's not OK for anybody else. If you have a culture like that, you know, if you have a culture where you know, spitting outside is OK, but you don't spit, your house is OK, but the moment you step out, you spit, well, you have a problem. So the question is, how do you bring about the change in the way people look at social issues and, uh, and bring about change? All you can do is do on a small scale. Uh, and if hundreds of people do similar things, I have a feeling it will change. Short of a revolution, I suppose. Hi, my name is Kritika Neger. Um, I'm a junior at CAS. And my, my question is actually, it has two parts to it. Uh, the first part, well, you said that there are only a few number of children that are enro enrolled in Shanti Bhavan. And so I was wondering, one, what is your cutoff for the maximum number of children that you accept? And two, how do you determine those children? Or what's your criteria to choose these children? Okay. Good question. Um, yeah, the maximum depends on how much money you have. Right now, the school is set up for 312, uh, 324 children. Okay, um, And we only have 200 something right now. Uh, we like to get to its full capacity. I love to see you know, many Shanti bonds, you know, keep it small, but have more Shanti bonds, you know, because the moment it becomes too big, it's, it's slightly difficult to do a good job. Uh, okay, that's the first part of the question. And the selection process is, it's got four criteria. First, they have to be below the poverty line. Uh, below the poverty line is defined as a family of five having something like $4 a day, okay? $4 a day for a family of five. So less than a dollar a day per person. That's the first criteria. Secondly, we give preference to uh, orphans and single mothers. Uh, third, the child has to be between three and a half and four years of age. Because we feel that unless you get the child at a very early age, you cannot change them. So these children are brought up by us. The parents' only job is to love them and encourage them. That's all we say. Only you have one job. We will get them married ourselves. We will find the husband for the kids. We'll do everything. You just love them and take care, you know, encourage them. That's all your job is. Come and see them every three months and say something nice and encourage them. OK? Um, so um, uh, that's one. And then we, we do not have the ability, in Chandibon at least, to care for um, any serious uh, physical or mental uh, disability, you know. It doesn't sound good, but that's, you know, world is not perfect. We just have to be selective. Who, you know, and we also do an IQ test, uh, but it's very unscientific. I, I haven't figured out how to test a child who's never used a paper or a pencil. And at the age three and a half, you do an IQ test. You know, I mean, ridiculous. We discover, we invented a methodology, but it doesn't work, really. <laughs> but uh, we do it anyway. My name is Abiram Kumar. I'm a freshman at Stern. Um, I spent a lot of my childhood in Bangalore. I grew up there. And so I can directly relate to when you talk about um, corrupt local governments. I was just wondering if you could talk about like a specific instance where you had to deal with government intervention and how you resolved it, uh, if there was any issue where they specifically tried to stop it. You want to tell a story it. about, yeah. my god. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think I said, told, just now told you a story very quickly. I said about this electric connection, right? Um, you know, we, we, we had a, you know, how it works is we have a farm. We wanted to start a farm and we needed drill wells. So we went to the government and said, listen, we need the electric power to be brought to that farm area so we can connect it so we can, our pumps will work. I said, no problem. Government officials always tell you, no problem. You go and do the wells. Drill it, start your farming, start you know, your process. Gets you, gets you into it, OK? And he said, file an application. So we filed the application. He said, one month, within one month, the electric connection will be given. One month later, nothing has happened. So we call up. So the guy says, you never submitted the application. He said, we submitted the application. Submit it again. So we submitted it again. Now, 
called next week. He said, yeah, application is there. But it's at the very bottom of the pile because you are at the last one. So how do I get it up to the top? OK, that's an exercise. So I, you know, we sent somebody and bribed this guy. He moved it up a little bit, OK? He moved up a little more. And then to cut the story down, you know, I mean, it took four or five months for this process. Finally, they said, yes, OK, you have electricity approved. Now nothing is happening. Now, I, by the way, I, by then I have bribed so many people by then. OK, small monies, but bribed a lot of them. Now he says, there is no electric pole. So what do I do? There's, there's electric poles sold by a private dealer. You can buy and bring it. We will put it up. So we went and bought the electric pole. So this guy then comes with a form. He said, so he bought it. Government bought it. So in other words, they will charge that. You know, OK, so the pole is so brought. Then he says, there is no transformer available. So we had to buy a transformer. So we bought the transformer. Then he says, there is no transport to bring him. So we send a vehicle and bring this guy. You know. And then he works for two hours. He said he has to go. So you had to keep on paying money, 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 money every time. Is that a good enough story? <laughs> yeah. My name is Anu Kriti. I'm from India. I yes. was born and brought up in Bihar. Oh, of my God. OK. One of the most backward places in India. And if it talk about it's improving, it, though. Yes, yeah. it is. We are the second one now. Yeah. And I lived and worked in Bangalore for a very long time. OK. And I've been in Chennai. I've been in Delhi. Okay. So there's one thing which has been bothering me. I am from the PR department, which is the School of Continuing Education. And I have nothing to do with Brannels Foundation. But this is one place where I came with a lot of questions. And I want to ask you one thing. I want to go back. And I want to do something. And I've been here two months. Yep. And I have a lot of thoughts. I have a lot of idea. And I've been trying to build a public discourse around topics. And recently, I read your blog about the education system, okay. one of them. My question is, why is that the youth hasn't been involved in it by most of the people who are in this sphere? Talking about the you know, 250 million people who have the money, people like us. We have the money. We, we also have the inclination. I think there hasn't been enough effort to kind of bind them together and make them work towards this field. I mean, this is something that I think a lot is, of Are you talking about youth here or youth, youth in India? Youth back home in India. Back home in India. See, the youth back home in India have no say. It's their parents, right? Uh, the parents decide whether, you know, what you should do, what you should study, and you are never given a break. There is no such thing as spending time off to do any social work. You have to keep on studying, 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 and then, you know, you, you do I'm this. I'm specifically talking about the people who are uh, as in uh, educated, who are yeah. already in the working class force and who have an income of above six lakhs and so. And they are a huge majority. So what is it? The I'm priorities are very different. No? There is no, there is no um, unlike here, where you know, our children, we, from a very young age, we want them to go to a hospital, do some social work during summertime. There is an idea of service, OK? Yeah. There is no such idea of service in India. There is some, an idea of education, a lot of studying, nonstop studying, competition for 500 seats, 500,000 people apply. That you have. There's no such thing as service. Service mostly is serving God, not serving human beings. And that is done by pilgrimage or some puja, you know, some worship, breaking a coconut or something, something. OK? That's that's service to God. But here, you know, people think of service to God as service to humanity. That concept is not really prevalent. You know, I'm not saying it's totally absent. It's certainly not there uh, yet in a big way. Okay. That's my personal belief. Okay, thank you. You know, we have people come to Shadi Bhavan and they say, listen, you know, oh, you're doing such wonderful work and so on, and then they they say, OK, will you make a donation? You say, no, uh, we don't have money. And then the next thing is their daughter is getting married, and the daughter's got gold ornaments <laughs> from top to bottom. So what do I say? <laughs> OK. It's Carol McGill. I'm a, a doctoral candidate in literacy studies at Hofstra University. And I've been reading a lot lately about the, how technology has created this uh, has ever-growing digital divide between the haves yeah. and the have-nots. 
and how your EDP system is designed really to try to bridge that divide healthcare, yeah. in healthcare. And I just wondered if you could speak a little bit about that and about the impact that the system has had in the villages. Okay, we try to, uh, we try to get this on a national scale done. We try to get it done uh, with the government, and we told the government that it will cost 25 cents a year per patient. 25 cents per patient per year. We'll give it to you just to bear the, co the cost. The, you know, the government's response was, well, you want to collect 25 cents from 700 million people? What do I respond to that, you know? I said, I said, okay, you guarantee 1 million people, I'll give it to you after that free. No answer. So very difficult. So we do it ourselves in Balde Clinic and, you know, locally. But government of Rwanda has asked us to start a, po a, a project in Rwanda. Uh, we have... Uh, proposals out to many African countries. And there are a number of uh, agencies uh, trying to work with us to implement this in Africa. India is a very difficult place to do this. Hi, my name's Rahul Mansali, and I study at the Stern School of Business. And I actually grew up in Mumbai, India also. And uh, after studying there, I feel like a lot of the part, I, I mean, a lot of awareness that comes around is uh, get, uh, get after you get an opportunity to act actually go somewhere and experience some things. Right. So like a lot of it, like I understand people come to Shanti Bhavan, they study there, but like even after they get educated, if they don't have opportunities, they right. really don't experience too much. Right. So like what sort of opportunities do you provide them in terms of like after they're educated, I'm sure the kids who've, gr who've like spent like 10 years now, they've grown up. So like wh what do those kids do? And like, I feel a lot of it is just the lack of innovation. People go and like join family businesses. So like no one's right, really right. willing to do something different. Right. So right. like what? Um, um, this, you know, I can go on explaining this. Uh, one of the things that I learned in America is to think for yourself. You know, you know rather than uh, somebody telling you what to think, how to think. Okay. So we encourage our children to innovate, to create, be creative, question the teachers. You know, in India, if you question a teacher, the teacher would say, "He's talking back at me. Can you see? He's talking back at me." A simple question from a kid, right? So we have to change the way the teachers think, not the, how the children think. So in Shanti Bhavan, children are very, very free, open. Um, they would question you, so that's one. Then we send them to uh, companies like Mercedes-Benz in Bangalore, SAP, Infosys. We take them there, we arrange with them, so they go and see how the factory is done. We take them to a bank, I see, I see, I see how the bank cash is checked. The rest of it, poverty, they'd already know. Now we will be taking them to shopping, shops in Bangalore, how to do shopping and so on. But still, they will have to invent, they will have to discover for themselves what life is like outside. That's all I can say. Uh, one more question, one more question? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, this is very personal to me because I'm also from India. My name is Saliha. And I worked in the tribal belts and the untouchable belts in uh, Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat, okay. etc. So okay. to see a m different model is very um, touching. I, I was very touched when I was working. Um, I'm piggybacking on the discourse and change. Right. And I went to school at Tata Institute of Social Sciences in Boston. Ah, okay. So I've come a long way today. I'm at the International Trauma Studies Program here. Yes. And um, the challenge I faced when I was at TIS was approaching social work slash service models as charity models. And our batch was one of the first batch that said, we are not going to take any on-campus interviews below a certain economic level. So my, my question to you is, we have taken business and we're taking business ideas and applying it as social entrepreneurship. There is still, and, and I'm pushing back in, as, as part of the dialogue, not to challenge, but just to create further dialogue. There is a hint of that it could be, the model that you're presenting could be uh, received as an aid model, both of which charity meaning service as charity, and the work that you're talking as aid, both of which, in my opinion, doesn't bring about social change in the discourse of how to approach service when, when you have an economic model which values, um, and I'm thinking the stress I'm talking, so 
when you have an economic model in, in, in the world which values certain services, certain professions as being a, a commodity that is of value and certain practices and professional services of not having, how do you shift that discourse as, as you're doing it? Because it's a very complicated yeah. question. I'm not sure I have Thank an answer you. for you. Uh, but um, you know, a perfect example is teaching profession. You know, teaching in uh, schools, not making much money. You know, while IT just get through an ID program and you make tons of money in Bangalore, right? Uh, but teachers are the ones who are going to make the world a difference. Not even computers. You know, I mean, everybody wants to sell the computers and everything else. But you know, a teacher can teach. I always say under a you know banyan tree and still you know, turn the child into a really, really good, you know, student, you know. So uh, the question is, um, um, you know, how do you bring about, you know, importance and value, some value to that type of activity? Um, I have to think through this thing. You know, I really don't have a quick answer for you. Um, you know, I haven't thought through well enough. 